Spelling Tuesday. Through cops and spinny marched bare, down open slopes of gorse and heather, over rocky beds of streams, up steep banks of sandstone into the heather again, and so at last, tired and hungry, to the Hundred Acre Wood. For it was in the Hundred Acre Wood that Owl lived. And if anyone knows anything about anything, said Bear to himself, it's Owl who knows something about something, he said. Or my name's not Winnie the Pooh, he said. Which it is, he added. So there you are. So now we come to Owl's house, as some of us have so many times before, searching for answers to questions of one sort or another. Will we find the answers here? Before we go in and take a look around, it seems appropriate to have a few background remarks about the kind of scholar that Owl represents, in relation to the attitudes and principles of Taoism that we are concerned with here. To begin with, it is necessary to point out that in China, scholars were generally Confucianist in training and orientation, and therefore often spoke a somewhat different language from the Taoists, who tended to see Confucianist scholars as busy ants spoiling the picnic of life, rushing back and forth to pick up the bits and pieces dropped from above. In the final section of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu wrote, quote, The wise are not learned, the learned are not wise, end quote, an attitude shared by countless Taoists before and since. From the Taoist point of view, while the scholarly intellect may be useful for analyzing certain things, deeper and broader matters are beyond its limited reach. The Taoist writer Shuangzi worded it this way, A well frog cannot imagine the ocean, nor can a summer insect conceive of ice. How then can a scholar understand the Tao? He's restricted by his own learning. It seems rather odd, somehow, that Taoism, the way of the whole man, the true man, the spirit man, to use a few Taoist terms, is for the most part interpreted here in the West by the scholarly owl, by the brain, the academician, the dry-as-dust absent-minded professor. Far from reflecting the Taoist ideal of wholeness and independence, this incomplete and unbalanced creature divides all kinds of abstract things into little categories and compartments, while remaining rather helpless and disorganized in his daily life. Rather than learn from Taoist teachings and from direct experience, he learns intellectually and indirectly from books. And since he doesn't usually put Taoist principles into practice in an everyday sort of way, his explanations of them tend to leave out some rather important details, such as how they work and where you can apply them. On top of that, it's very hard to find any of the spirit of Taoism in the lifeless writings of the humorless academic mortician, whose bleached out scholarly dissertations contain no more of the character of Taoist wisdom than does the typical wax museum. But that's the sort of thing we can expect from the abstract owl, the dried-up Western descendant of the Confucianist dedicated scholar who, unlike his noble but rather unimaginative ancestor, thinks he has some sort of monopoly on... What's that? Pooh interrupted. What's what? I asked. What you just said. The Confucianist desiccated scholar. Well, let's see. The Confucianist desiccated scholar is one who studies knowledge for the sake of knowledge and who keeps what he learns to himself or to his own small group writing pompous and pretentious papers that no one else can understand, rather than working for the enlightenment of others. How's that? Much better, said Pooh. Owl is about to illustrate the Confucianist desiccated scholar, I said. I see, said Pooh. Which brings us back to Owl. Let's see. How did Rabbit describe the situation with Owl? Oh, here it is. You can't help respecting anybody who can't spell Tuesday, even if he doesn't spell it right. But spelling isn't everything. There are days when spelling Tuesday simply doesn't count. By the way, Pooh, how do you spell Tuesday? Spell what? Asked Pooh. Tuesday. You know, Monday, Tuesday. My dear Pooh, said Owl, everybody knows that it's spelled with a two. It is? Asked Pooh. Of course, said Owl. After all, it's the second day of the week. Oh, is that the way it works? asked Pooh. All right, Owl, I said. Then what comes after Tuesday? Thursday, said Owl. Owl, you're just confusing things, I said. This is the day after Tuesday, and it's not thirds, I mean Thursday. Then what is it? asked Owl. It's today, squeaked Piglet. My favorite day, said Pooh. Ours too. We wonder why the scholars don't think much of it. Perhaps it's because they confuse themselves thinking about other days so much. Now, one rather annoying thing about scholars is that they are always using big words that some of us can't understand. Well, said Owl, the customary procedure in such cases is as follows. What does crustimony proceed cake mean? Said Pooh. For I am a bear of very little brain, and long words bother me. It means the things to do. As long as it means that, I don't mind, said Pooh humbly. 
and one sometimes gets the impression that those intimidating words are there to keep us from understanding. That way, the scholars can appear superior and will not likely be suspected of not knowing something. After all, from the scholarly point of view, it's practically a crime not to know everything. But sometimes the knowledge of the scholar is a bit hard to understand because it doesn't seem to match up with our own experience of things. In other words, knowledge and experience do not necessarily speak the same language. But isn't the knowledge that comes from experience more valuable than the knowledge that doesn't? It seems fairly obvious to some of us that a lot of scholars need to go outside and sniff around, walk through the grass, talk to the animals, that sort of thing. Lots of people talk to animals, said Pooh. Maybe, but... Not very many listen, though, he said. That's the problem, he added. In other words, you might say that there is more to knowing than just being correct. As the mystical poet Han Shan wrote, A scholar named Wang laughed at my poems. The accents are wrong, he said. Too many beats. The meter is poor. The wording is impulsive. I laugh at his poems as he laughs at mine. They read like the words of a blind man describing the sun. Quite often, struggling like a scholar over relatively unimportant matters can make one increasingly confused. Pooh described the Confucianist state of mind quite accurately. On Monday, when the sun is hot, I wonder to myself a lot. Now, is it true or is it not? That what is which and which is what? On Tuesday, when it hails and snows, the feeling on me grows and grows, that hardly anybody knows if those are these or these are those. On Wednesday, when the sky is blue and I have nothing else to do, I sometimes wonder if it's true that who is what and what is who. On Thursday, when it starts to freeze, and hoarfrost twinkles on the trees, how very readily one sees that these are whose, but whose are these? On Friday. Yes, whose are these, anyway? To the desiccated scholars, putting names on things is the most vital activity in the world. Tree. Flower. Dog. But don't ask them to prune the tree, plant the flower, or take care of the dog, unless you enjoy unpleasant surprises. Living, growing things are beyond them, it seems. Now, scholars can be very useful and necessary, in their own dull and unamusing way. They provide a lot of information. It's just that there's something more, and that something more is what life is really all about. Say, Pooh, have you seen my other pencil? I saw Owl using it a little while ago, said Pooh. Oh, here it is. What's this? Aardvarks and their aberrations? Beg pardon? said Pooh. Aardvarks and their aberrations, what Owl was writing about. Oh, were they? said Pooh. Say, this pencil's all chewed up. One more funny thing about knowledge, that of the scholar, the scientist, or anyone else. It always wants to blame the mind of the uncarved block, what it calls ignorance, for problems that it causes itself, either directly or indirectly, through its own limitations, nearsightedness, or neglect. For example, if you built your house where the wind can blow it over, then let it go to pieces while you worry about how to spell marmalade, what is likely to happen? Of course, anyone knows that. Yet when Owl's house falls down, what does he have to say about it? Who? said Owl severely. Did you do that? No, said Pooh humbly. I don't think so. Then who did? I think it was the wind, said Piglet. I think your house has blown down. Oh, is that it? I thought it was Pooh. No, said Pooh. For the chapter's concluding word about knowledge for the sake of knowledge, let's recall an incident from the house at Pooh Corner. Eeyore was busy in intimidating Piglet with something he'd made from three sticks. Do you know what A means, little Piglet? No, Eeyore, I don't. It means learning. It means education. It means all the things that you and Pooh haven't got. That's what A means. Oh, said Piglet again. I, I mean, does it? He explained quickly. I'm telling you. People come and go in this forest, and they say, It's only Eeyore, so it doesn't count. They walk to and fro, saying, Ha ha, but do they know anything about A? They don't. It's just three sticks to them. But to the educated, mark this little piglet, to the educated, not meaning poos and piglets, it's a great and glorious A. Not, he added. Just something that anybody can come and breathe on. Then Rabbit came along. There's just one thing I wanted to ask you, Eeyore. What happens to Christopher Robin in the mornings nowadays? What's this that I'm looking at? Said Eeyore, still looking at it. Three sticks, said Rabbit promptly. You see, said Eeyore to Piglet. 
He turned to Rabbit. I will now answer your question, he said solemnly. Thank you, said Rabbit. What does Christopher Robin do in the mornings? He learns. He becomes educated. He instigorates. I think that's the word he mentioned, but I may be referring to something else. He instigorates knowledge. In my small way, I also, if I have the right word, am, am doing what he does. That, for instance, is an A, said Rabbit, but not a very good one. Well, I must get back and tell the others. Eeyore looked at his sticks, and then he looked at Piglet. He knew? You mean this A thing is a thing that Rabbit knew? Clever, said Eeyore scornfully, putting a foot heavily on his three sticks. Education, said Eeyore bitterly, jumping on his six sticks. What is learning? asked Eeyore, as he kicked his twelve sticks into the air. A thing Rabbit knows. Ha! Huh. So there. I know something that Rabbit doesn't know, said Piglet. Oh, what's that? I asked. Well, I, I can't remember what it's called, but... Oh, yes, that's what's coming up next, I said. Oh, what is it called? said Piglet, tapping his foot. Well, let's see.